a course in philosophy and human values uh, may seem paradoxical because uh, philosophy was that discipline uh, in, the, in our traditions, that's Western traditions, Western civilization, that began with the search for unconditioned knowledge, unconditioned by human knowledge of things that transcend this world or any other. Uh, that tradition is very much uh, alive in philosophy today, mostly in formal logic and mathematics, where it seems in place. And uh, professional philosophers have a name for that tradition. It's the analytic tradition in philosophy. Uh, a course in philosophy and human values has very little to gain from that tradition. And the reason for that, I think, is quite simple. It's because philosophy and its interaction with societies, cultures, and in its historical context is very difficult to quantify. It's very difficult to turn into a logical formula. And as a matter of fact, no one I think, and I, I've, I've met a lot of philosophers uh, since that's what I do for a living, uh, has ever demonstrated that uh, a deductive argument, a logical argument, one that's purely formal, has ever solved a single philosophical problem except internally, the, all, the ones they made themselves. It's, it's kind of like housekeeping where you spill the stuff and then you clean it up and you spill it again. And uh, a lot of analytic philosophy is like that. What I'd like to try today is to do something a little different, and that's to place philosophy in a historical context and then go through that and follow the mutation of problems centered on what it means to be human, a question that for me will begin with, uh, for me will begin, uh, with a kind of skeptical attitude. In other words, we won't begin as though we know what human nature is. A common and, I think, absolutely insidious kind of fallacy promulgated especially in a society like ours that's capitalist and so on, where subjects need to be of a certain kind in order to function in the state and in the economy. So it's, it's important in a society like that to have a rigid definition of what human being is for, uh, for a whole host of reasons that I hope will become apparent. But I'd like to begin with it as a kind of skeptical questioning, questioning and uh, so I'll come to my first topic. Uh, a book standardly used in introductory philosophy courses, and one that I'll refer to only briefly today, is The Trial and Death of Socrates by a, sm a little known author named Plato. So if there, if there are any members uh, of the audience or of, that are watching this, that are worried about, is this going to be a talk sort of uh, off of the standard texts, you know? Uh, some talk about uh, uh, the lesbian, the phallus in romantic novels. Don't worry about it. We're going to be talking about Plato, so you, know, you can relax, chill out. It's not going to be a, it's not going to be a problem. Uh, Socrates inaugurates the Western philosophical tradition in a very interesting way, and one of the ways he does it is by separating philosophical discourse in a kind of a way from scientific discourse. Uh, we can think of the earliest Greek philosophers, Thales, Anaximander, and Anaxagoras and others who studied the cosmos. And I think you're familiar with the word cosmos from other famous television shows. I mean, you've heard Carl Sagan, cosmos, you know, and that is kind of the way you need to say it uh, for the Greeks too, because uh, we get other English words from cosmos, for example, cosmetic, where for the Greeks, uh, the cosmos was sort of cosmetic. It appeared, and that was enough, and it appeared to be harmonious and beautiful and orderly. That made it an object of study. If it had appeared chaotic to them, uh, it wouldn't have been an object of study. It, it was its order that made it possible to uh, study it. And uh, we know from, uh, at least we think we know, from the text that when Socrates was young, he studied in this tradition and was interested in the cosmos, in what things were made of. And the Greeks had rather simple answers. Uh, things were made of fire, some thought of water, some thought of earth, fire, water, and air, and various other accounts. And for a, a, a rather long time in Western civilization, the account that there were four elements, earth, fire, water, and air, was the dominant scientific account for a long time. Uh, in any case, uh, Socrates began in this tradition, but he inaugurates philosophy uh, in, in the spirit in which I hope I'm going to talk about it for the next few hours, uh, by changing the focus away from the investigation 
into the movements of stars and the composition of the earth and directs the investigation of philosophy towards human beings. And this, this should be well known. I mean, it's, it's an ordinary uh, thing to know about Socrates. Uh, know thyself for Socrates was the beginning of wisdom and uh, Socrates, for him, this was more than a mere motto. If you, this, all the Socratic dialogues are in a sense, uh, it's important to understand first that they're dialogues. They're written in dialogic form. In Greek society, and this will be my first amateur sociological remark, in Greek society, knowledge comes to be in a public place where reasoned arguments have to take place in the open, in a public forum. That's to be greatly contrasted, just by point of contrast, with a society like ours where most of the important arguments that shape our destiny are secret. Uh, in Greek society, that's unthinkable because a polis is a place where the only force that a free person is supposed to recognize is that peculiarly unforced force of the better argument. That's what, that's what differentiates you from a slave. You don't argue with slaves in Greek society, you, they obey and you, t and you tell them. But when it's a discussion among free citizens, they can't recognize your force as part of the argument. It has to be that strange, unforced force that happens when someone just convinces you with an argument that you go, wow, I think that's better than my argument, I think you're right. So the dialogues are built on that form of political life, where dialogue is essential to knowledge. Uh, later in the course, when we discuss the rise of modern society, we will get a peculiar new way of human beings understanding themselves, a way that, uh, well, that I'll attach the name Descartes to right now, a way where you sort of introspect and figure things out, sort of a forerunner to Shirley MacLaine, except more sophisticated. You kind of introspect and sort of talk to your own inner self. Well, for the Greeks, this was no way to achieve knowledge. It was through talking with other people, and uh, I don't want to make this sound sort of too, uh, I don't know, prep schooly, because if you read the, the dialogues, uh, Socrates is flirting with both the men and the women that he did, you know, talks to, mostly talks to men. This is Western tradition, right? So very, the women are, I guess, doing the housework and showing up you know, in, the, in the jail cell when he's about to die and stuff and whining or whatever. However these guys wrote it, you know, that's why I'm a little dubious about some of the texts. In any case, uh, uh, the, the, the two important points that I hope that I've sort of moved around, one, Socrates turns the investigation of philosophy towards human concern and away from the cosmos. And that already begins a fateful distinction that will later be discussed in, I guess the book was in the 40s or whatever, C.P. Snow's book, The Two Cultures, okay? The culture of science and the culture of the humanities. That split has its origin, in a way, in Socrates turning his attention away from sort of one of the cultures, the culture that was going to investigate nature and human beings as though they were simply in it somewhere, and the culture that investigates human beings qua human, in other words, as human, and as opposed to as one species among other or whatever. Uh, so that's, that's and, and then that makes knowing yourself a, a crucially important part of knowledge. Now, to make this as simple as I can, I love to use references to movies. You know, I mean, not many of us read anymore, but a lot of us go to movies. In Superman 1, okay, let's get out, get out to a real case, okay? In Superman 1, little baby Superman is flying from the very sophisticated planet to Earth, and there are all these knowledge crystals, and I didn't like the 